Hey. Hey. How are you? Good. What you doing? Not much. Cool. Not real. Well, uh, we're interviewing you. Okay. Today, our guest is George Strombolopoulos. He, ex ex he has an extensive and award-winning career in radio and TV as a host primarily conducting interviews. You may know him from much music, CNN or CBC. He works in TV and film as a writer, director, and producer. He joins us today from Toronto. Thank you for taking your time with us, with us today. Really good to see you too. Thanks for uh, for letting me be a part of it. Now, do you ever uh, mess with people and switch where Bob and Tom are on the marquee behind you so people don't know who's who? Do you ever do that for fun? Mm, no, we could try it. But think about it. If you look at the marquee, it is reversed to who's where. Oh, it is. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm Tom. I'm Bob, Bob Pisa. Very cool. Good to see you. I'm George. Lovely to see you too. Hey, congratulations on your congratulations on your talk show. That's great. Yeah, it's going it's going pretty well. If you have any questions for George, please put them in the comments. Um, sorry if we don't get to your questions, but we have a lot. Okay, so let's get this started. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, what have you been doing during COVID nineteen? You know, I've been working a lot. That's the truth. So I, before COVID, for the last five years, um, I have been doing my radio show, my CBC show, out of my house anyway. So here's my studio, right? This is where I work. Um, you can see, like, so I've been working and recording shows. So I've been doing that for ages anyway. And um, so it, it hasn't changed that much for me in the practical sense. The the It's just, I, you know, obviously, like everybody, you know, you your heart breaks and you worry about people who are in difficult situations and who are compromised and and all that but when i'm just living my life here in my home it's uh it's kind of the same except people don't come over which i'm fine with too so it's been um a bit, it's been a lot of work making a lot of radio shows okay k kaylee asks what what do you like on your pizza well uh so i don't eat meat or cheese anymore and um so it's different when i was eating meat and cheese when i wasn't a, a, a plant-based diet eater it was I, i'm a simple uh, guy guys i just wanted pepperoni pepperoni and i would throw some chili peppers on it and it was perfect for me i i love pineapple on pizza i'm one of those people i love pineapple yeah, on pizza. I, have, I have too so right on bob that's it yeah i love no it. pineapples I, no no, oh. no. It's a nice little sweet moment for every salty pizza, but I love late night pizza. In your face, Chris Van Vliet. He did not want, let, he did not, he was not on the side of pineapple on pizza. Well, guess what? He was on pepperoni side. Good stuff. Well, I'm always on the pepperoni side. Now that I don't eat meat, I'm looking for fake, fake pepperoni, and I found fake pepperoni that's pretty good. More Chris asks about how did you like the John Prime show in your house? You know, John Prine is one of the greatest songwriters to have ever lived, and he he just passed away because of, he had coronavirus, um, COVID nineteen. Um, but before Christmas of the year before, he uh, he agreed to come play a concert in my living room, and my uncle came, my uncle Paul, who introduced me to music, uh, this kind of music. Gordon Lightfoot, the legendary Canadian songwriter, came by, and they watched, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had in my life. And I, it sort of didn't even occur to me that. It was my living room anymore. It was just this incredible, intimate gathering where one of the best songwriters ever who made everybody laugh and cry. You know, Jim Cuddy from Blue Rodeo was here. Like all of these, so many great Canadian artists just came over to watch. It was really, it was really beautiful. And um, John is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, and he's the guy that Bob Dylan listened to. Like he's that good. And it just, yeah, it, it broke my heart when we lost him. But I feel so lucky, so privileged that John agreed to play a concert in my living room. It's one for the ages. Rashid94 asks, who is your favorite band from the 60s? His is British Rock Invasion, I think. No. Oh, the British Rock Invasion. From the British Rock Invasion, sorry. Oh, the British Rock Invasion. So what is my favorite British band? Well, the late it's Led Zeppelin, like from the late 60s. I know that that's, that comes a little bit near the end of the 60s, and they were more of a 70s band uh, in terms of the culture. But Led Zeppelin are by far my favorite and uh, and i would also say t-rex 
this guy called Mark Bolden T Rex, which is more glam. So again, that's a different. But it's from the, it's the British bands that came from the '60s and the '70s. Those are the guys that I that I liked the most. Um, but Zeppelin, you know, the late '70s was more British punk, like the the uh, the Clash and Crass. But from that late '60s, early '70s, it's definitely um, Led Zeppelin for sure. Mano, Manabo, uh, Manabo asks about your favorite cartoon show growing up. What is your favorite one today? My favorite cartoon show today is Rick and Morty. Yes! Uh, that's the best, you watch it, that's the best show. That's my yes. favorite show in the world right now. Um, Rick and Morty, I watch a lot, I love it. I love The Simpsons still, uh, definitely. Simpsons happened when I was in my early, late teens, early 20s, I think when it first started, um, because it was on, a, on another show called The Tracy Ullman Show. Um, as a kid, for cartoons, I watched The Flintstones. That was my regular show, watching the Flintstones, for sure. Um, there was the raccoons that would do show the raccoon specials I would watch. But really, but today it's all, it's all Rick and Morty. Does that happen with the right show at your house that you forget it's your own house? Yeah, it happens a lot. Because, um, you know, you, you bring all these people in, some I know, some I don't know. And they just come in and, and we all hang out. And then all of a sudden, this band starts to play. And, and I, I go to the fridge, I get a drink, I come back, I watch. Everybody's sort of milling out. I'm a pretty easygoing guy to begin with in that respect. So it's like, ah, whatever. And then, and then every now and then, I'm like, oh, right, this is my living room. I live here. Usually when the band, the artists will say to me, do you actually live here? And I'm like, I do, I do. Uh, and then they ask to use the shower. They got to use the bathroom or, they, or you know, I'm going to get them a towel or something. It happens a lot. Huh, that's kind of funny. Uh, drop, drop Jen an email asks if there is a way to attend uh on one a one of your home events online. She lives in BC. On, on it's a good question. Online, you know, we haven't done it before. Too too. I do a little bit of it. I live stream some of it on Instagram. Um, but only a little bit. Uh, there, I, I suspect we'll be doing more of that soon. Maybe we'll do them on Zoom or, or on like a virtual town hall or something. Uh, live YouTube. You started your media career in radio. Did you plan to move to TV or did it just happen? Just happened. It just happened. You know, I got into radio so long ago, uh, like way before the internet. And um, we there was a thing called Pirate Radio, which was an illegal radio station. That was my very first you know, before internet radio stations, it was really hard to get a job at a radio station. So this guy who built an illegal one, and that's how I started my career. Um, so I went, and I never thought about television ever. And then as time went on, much music, I, I had hosted one comedy show because they needed somebody last minute. Some friends said, oh, we're in, a, we're in a bind, can you help us out? So I did that. But I never thought about TV until much music came and offered me a job. And then I was like, oh, well, okay, sure, maybe I'll do that. Sort of like your Instagram show, actually. Yeah, very, very raw, very last minute. But this is the thing, guys, right? To me, the, the real value in having, like, and you have this now with people watching your stuff. If you don't have a real human connection with them, what's the point? And obviously, I'm a lot older than you, and you guys are younger, and you're a little bit newer at this. But as you start to figure it out, it's, it's just really important to be real and to have a real connection with people, which you do really well. And that's, that, so to me, that's why my Instagram stuff is like that too. You know, I mean, I swear more than you guys do, so you don't want to do that. But aside from that, you know, it's about being real and, and keeping people company, especially during these really tough times. Which do you prefer, the screen or the speakers? I prefer the speakers. I prefer the speakers. You know, I prefer, uh, I prefer a microphone and playing music and, and sharing that with people. I prefer the TV. It's louder. You know what, though? The more you, the more you succeed in television, the more room you get to do what you want in radio. So that, to me, was... T I found that in radio, there was a lot of very strict rules you had to abide by. But the more time I spent on television, radio people gave me more leeway. So... Uh, you know, I like the way I make radio now, but I wouldn't be able to make it this way if I didn't have television. Uh, early in your career, you worked for Moses Nimer, who our dad yeah. says was a media pioneer in Canada. What did you learn from Mo Moses, and do you keep in touch with him? 
I don't keep in touch with Moses as much. I don't really see him as much, but, but I mean, I would say hi for sure. Um, you know what Moses was really great at? You know, like my last name is Strombolopoulos. It's a crazy last name, right? 17 letters in my last name. And there are, you know, there's a long time in media where if you were ethnic, you had to change your name to sound like you weren't ethnic, right? They wanted like easy names that didn't have any ethnicity to them. Moses Neimer created a culture in Toronto on a channel called City TV, where if you were ethnic, you got to be ethnic. He didn't, he didn't try to whitewash everybody's ethnicity and give us fake names. He made us, he let us be us, which was really important. Moses put a lot of women on television, a lot of people of color on television, a lot of people with ethnicity on television. So I learned, and it wasn't just Moses, he had a, commun a team that did that with him, right? A woman called Phyllis Switzer, a woman called Denise Donlin, a man called David Kynes. They, cr they really fed a culture where you didn't have to hide your, hide your heritage, right? And I think that was really, really important. And Moses uh, helped to create that space for us. And I'm grateful for that. So I learned, I learned that you have to stick to your guns. Moses, like Moses, I didn't know him that well, but I knew him a little bit. And he was always that guy. He's like, you, you, have, you have values and you honor your values. Uh, the way you make radio, is it like what FM radio used to be as compared to the way it is now? Well, the radio that I make on the Strombo show is very much like that 70s FM radio in terms of, you know, the music you play and the kind of riskier conversations you can have. But no, radio is not like that anymore. Most radio is very narrow. Most radio isn't particularly exciting. I'm talking music. If you are a music fan that has wide tastes, right? If you like straight up pop music, radio is great for you. But the, the kind of 70s radio that made me and my friends fall in love with radio, that doesn't exist as much. It does online now. So there's a lot of great stations where you can listen online. How did you develop your interviewing style? My, my interviewing style? Yeah. Have you guys heard about The Last Dance, that Netflix series that's got the Michael Jordan stuff in the Chicago Bulls? Yes, I have. So um, my very first one-on-one -on -one interview I ever did in my life was with Scottie Pippen from the Chicago Bulls. And I, just over time, and I'm not sure how much it was I developed it and how much it was just me. So what I did was I found a way to be me. And all I did was apply craft to it, right? Which is experience and practice and learning. I also, what's really important when you're interviewing is be around people who can teach you how to do it. I was lucky enough to work with a woman called Tanya Nachev, who really helped me develop as an interviewer. And a guy called Dave Bookman, uh, a radio legend in Toronto, who helped me develop as an interviewer. And they didn't overtly teach you what to do. They just gave you pointers and kind of helped guide you. But really the secret to being a good interviewer, I think, is you have to be yourself. And if you're comfortable with yourself and you're a good listener, because you know what it is, right, guys? When you're interviewing, and this happens to all of us, you have a list of questions you want to ask. But what's important to make sure is that you're listening to the person so that when they answer, you might have a new question in your mind, right? And it wasn't one that you prepared for. And that, to me, comes from experience and comfort and knowing who you are and being comfortable. So I learned from a lot of really great people. Um, is this something that you guys want to keep doing as you get as you grow? Probably, yeah. Maybe yeah. we can. I have other things in mind besides that. Uh, what else? Uh, maybe sports. I don't know. Miss. Uh, so Miss nineteen fifty seven fly asks. What music do me and Bob like? So I like rock and I like rock and roll. It's like literally my favorite thing. I just and punk music. And I punk? Just, um, yeah, like alternative, not much. Nice. Nice. What kind of punk do you like? What kind of alter What kind of bands do you like? Uh, uh okay. I have a wide range. I can probably listen to. I listen to some Motorhead. And I know I listen to In Excess, Nickelback, ACDC. Those are all great choices. Those are all great choices. And, and how about you, Bob? Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really social about it. Smart, smart. Okay, let's go back to 
back to Christmas. Okay. okay. How much research do you put in before each interview? Um, a lot, like a lot. I am. Um, I. Uh, you know. The thing that's interesting about research is, is as you get more experienced, you you realize that everybody has access to the same research that you do, right? You because everybody goes on the internet and searches for the things. The real secret to an interview is preparing yourself a lot, and then taking that research you have and trying to make connections with that information, right? So it's not just you read something and go, oh, let me ask about that. After you ask about that, you try to explore a little bit more about the why, you know? So for me, when I do research, you learn a lot about what people do. What I try to do with that information is try to figure out why people do what they do. And that's not always apparent in the research. That doesn't always come up in the research, right? So, um, but you have to do a lot. And you know, the secret guys is that if you don't do a lot of research, then you don't need, to, then it sometimes feels like you're not showing respect mm -hmm. to the person that's sitting across from you. And if you, if they see that you've put the work in and that you've done the research, then they're more likely to tell you things because you have done that work. Okay, Kay, Kaylee asks, is there any group that people will be surprised you listen to? Oh, a lot, yeah. You know who I love is All Saints. People would be surprised that I like All Saints. This is like this girl group, pop group from back in the day. I like them. There's a couple songs that I love. And I love a couple songs from the Spice Girls as well. But I listen to mostly heavy music, right? But I love that stuff. People are sometimes surprised when they realize how much I like country music and how much I like dance music. Like I love DJs. I love DJs. I love techno music and sometimes people who don't know me look at me and they think I'm just into metal and punk because I'm wearing black all the time and I'm always talking about loud music but I love country music and I love um I love uh, dance music yeah I here's something I honestly I just can't stand country music he doesn't really like country music but dude honestly country. Like, if you like Motorhead you should listen to Johnny Cash and you should listen to Loretta Lynn. Like, there's some amazing country music from out there. How long have you been playing piano? I've been playing piano since I was 13 years old. So that is 34 years I've been playing piano. Wow, exactly, Bob. Wow. I've been playing piano a long time. Who is your, Who is your favorite, favorite band, band to meet? The Beastie Boys. I met the Beastie Boys and I met uh, Joe Strummer from The Clash. Those were really, really, that, like, those were really special to me to meet them. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I grew up listening to them and they helped shape me into the person I am. There's also a rap group called Public Enemy and Chuck D. I was so, when I met Chuck D, I was really, really excited about that. For any of, when you were meeting bands, for any time were you star starstruck? You know, I was never starstruck, but every now and then, every now and then, I would, like I, like I said, because most of the time when I was doing an interview, I would just do the interview. I would, like, I would be so present that I wouldn't think about it. I wouldn't think about who they are, where we were, what we were doing, right? But every now and then, I would kind of zoom out and from, from above, see what's happening in my mind, and think, oh my goodness, this is Metallica. You know, when, when James from Metallica came to my house, I was shocked. So that was pretty exciting, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of times that that's happened to us. I, I bet. Who has excited you? Mostly seeing somebody from the NHL, that, that was awesome. Seeing uh, Ryan Reeves. That's awesome. I once played hockey and I was, I was playing hockey and I thought I had a real good shot at scoring. So I'm in front of the net. I'm not a great skater. So I'm, you know, you kind of get low in front of the net you put your stick down and you're trying not to get muscled off the puck. So the puck is about to come to me and I'm as far as I know, wide open. And I'm like, this is amazing. I'm going to have a shot here. And suddenly somebody from behind me steals the puck. Right. And I look over and he smacks me gently on the legs with his stick and he laughs and it was Wayne Gretzky. And I was like, oh, Gretzky robbed me. Gretzky robbed me. That, that's, 
Okay, okay, I, I kind of did that. That's amazing. Okay, keep uh, I want to play something for you guys on the piano because of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, let's go for it. All right, let's go here one second. Let me come downstairs. 85, so now I'm going to know what's going to do. So can you recognize, can you recognize this? <laughs> Theme from Rick and Morty. Whoa. That's the Rick and Morty theme. No, I kind of recognize that. I've been trying to learn that. I've been trying to learn that on the piano. Huh. Okay. Right. Has it surprised people on your Instagram lives your piano skills? Yeah. Every I play. I do Instagram lives about four nights a week, sometimes more, and. Usually there's a couple of comments where somebody will come on and go, what? Especially, you know, because I, I, I generally look and act much gnarlier, you know, so they expect me, they don't expect me to sit there and play, you know. So they're just like surprised that, you know, and so there, there are definitely people that are surprised by it. Yeah. Who inspires you as a who, who inspires you as a piano player? As a piano player, there was a guy called Little Richard. I met Little Richard when I was 18 years old. He's the real king of rock and roll in my mind. And Little Richard played piano with, because, you know, the piano kind of feels like a very proper instrument, right? You know, it's like very proper, right? And... When I saw the, I saw Little Richard in concert when I was a teenager, and Little Richard played piano recklessly, and it was very rock and roll. And I was really young and thought, "Oh my goodness!" That because my mom forced me to take piano lessons. I didn't want to. I'm now grateful that she did, but I didn't want to when I was young. And the to see Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis play piano the way they did, those were huge, huge inspirations to me. Clark Monroe put this question on our Facebook page. Uh, he likes to know about your connection with Gord Downey of the Tragically Hip and what Gord meant to you from a music point of view, but also life in general. You know, Gord, Gord meant an awful lot to me, like he meant to a lot of people. I was very lucky to interview Gord for the first time, I think it was 1999 or something like that when I first met the band and interviewed them. He, um, one of the great things about Gordon, this is what his big, like Gord was a great front person, obviously. He was a great poet, a great singer, a great performer, all of that. But whenever you were in Gord's company, what you saw, what made him really special was that Gord was a great listener. He was really curious about life and he was curious about you. And he loved to learn and he loved to listen and he loved to share what he learned with you. And I think that, that, that was, that's a big inspiration. You know, I was 25, I think, 26 years old when I first met him. And I was a really big Tragically Hip fan, still am. And I'll never forget how Gord, you know, sometimes when you interview people, guys, right? People don't listen, they're, just, they're there just to talk. And when you, when you talk to a person like Gord, he listened. He listened and he made you better because he didn't let you off the hook. If you asked a question that wasn't legit or well thought out, Gord would just say, what do you mean by that? And you better have an answer, right? So there was this expectation that you were going to meet him on his level. He was very, very lovely. Very lovely. If you were going to give a timeline to kids to learn the history of punk music, where would they start? Which bands would be highlights along the timeline today? Well, now you're asking me the, the best question you could ever ask me. This is the thing that I'm the most excited to talk about is punk rock. I think, okay, look, here's the thing about kids and punk rock. You're 11 now, you guys are 11? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the truth is, even though your parents might like punk rock, a lot of what punk rock bands sing about, people might think you're too young to listen to, right? The words and the themes and all that. But punk rock is meant to be rebellious. So, you know, 
So the bands I'm going to mention, there are going to be people who think I shouldn't be telling 11 year olds this, but it's my responsibility to tell you this. So I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it up to your family to decide how you do it. But you got to start with a band called the Stooges, right? In the late 60s, the Stooges, the Ashton brothers, and a singer called Iggy Pop, right? Had this band called the Stooges. David Bowie produced a couple of their records. Do you know the David Bowie song, very famous song called The Gene Genie? Gene Genie lives in, right? That's written about Iggy Pop, the lead singer of the Stooges. So, I think you have to start with the Stooges. You then have to jump to around 19, so that's late 60s, 69, 70. You then have to jump to Patti Smith. Patti Smith is hanging around the Lower East Side, the Bowery in New York City at the time when the Ramones are coming out. Then you got to go from Patti Smith to the Ramones. And then from the Ramones in 76, my, my friends, you got to go to England because 1977, is basically the beginning of the punk that we know it to be, right? The Ramones did this big tour in 75, 76, I think. So 77. But before you do that, the Stooges and Patti Smith, then you got to go to the Ramones and then the Clash. And then when you're ready, when you're ready, there's a band called Crass. C-R-A-S-S. -S. And of course, the Sex Pistols and the Damned and the Cramps and all that for sure. But Stooges, Patty, the Ramones, and when you're ready, Crass. It's a whole different sound. It's a whole, and then in there, and in there, because when you guys hit about 12, 13 years old, the perfect band for you are the Misfits. And the Misfits are like designed for us when we're that age. And I still listen. One of my tattoos is, is because of the Misfits, right? And this is from the Ramones and the Clash. So... That's, those are the bands I would really recommend. Just put in the back of your head Crass. I heard Crass for the first time when I was 13. That's when I first started listening to Crass, and it blew my mind. I was like, what? And I knew my mom would kill me if she heard me listening to that stuff. But So I was about 13 when I first got into it. Fugazi uh, yeah. is linked from the House of Strombo website. Why? Well, because it's funny. If you go on the Str House of Strombo, uh, Strombo show website, yeah, Strombo.com, I have a link because once you get out of those bands that I was talking about, the creation of punk in that era, um, out of the West Coast in America is a band called the Dead Kennedys. And out of Washington was a band called Fugazi. And well, before that, Minor Threat. And they're both led by this guy. They were led by this guy called Ian Mackay. So Ian Mackay helps create hardcore music, which is which stems from punk. And... Ian Mackay was, wasn't just a great musician and like they weren't just great bands, Fugazi, but they were important cultural figures and political and social activists. So that's why I put Fugazi on there because I want, if anybody wants to come to my website, strombo.com and see things that they might be interested in and they just see Fugazi and they clink on it, they'll get taken to a whole other world because I think it's really important that people know who Fugazi are they're a truly important, important hardcore band. And that's my job, right? My job is to share good music with people. Oh, we recently spoke to Arno O'Kell, who made wrestling a huge part of his early broadcasting career in Canada. He then went to work for WWE, and since leaving WWE, he admits to being a lapsed fan. Has the same happened to you with hockey since leaving Hockey Night? You know what? That's a good question. I wasn't a lapsed fan, but I certainly needed to take a break from it for a, for a little while. You know, I, I, I watch a lot of hockey and I watched a lot of hockey. But after the Hockey Night in Canada thing ended the way it ended, I just kind of, I still played hockey, so I didn't take a break from hockey. I just didn't watch it as much as I had for a little while. It also helped the fact that my favorite team sucks. The Montreal Canadiens suck. They, they miss the playoffs all the time. They make it every now and then. Like, so it didn't, it was a little bit easier to take a break when my favorite team was so brutal, you know, and, and a couple of shining moments. And then, you know, what happened because I used to be an NBA reporter. I'm a huge Raptor fan. So then the Raptors got good and I was able to watch the Raptors on their rise to the championship. If, when you were hired 
as the Hockey Night, Hockey Night host, you were wanted to highlight more players' personalities. Do you want, do you think hockey could reach a greater success by following your advice? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it wasn't even about like it's not even just my thing. It was it wasn't just about hockey's players' personalities. What it was was putting everybody in a position to a make the best show, but also to highlight the stars of the game. It's one of the real successes of the NBA, right? Uh, is the stars in the NBA, and it, it it's it's not so much about the personalities, but it's asking hockey players to have a more important role on the national stage. And the thing is, hockey culture doesn't really want that. Hockey culture is very much about asking you to fit in, right? That never really jived with my personality. My personality is not fit in. My personality is let's make the world a better place. And you can't make the world a better place by fitting in. So there was no chance that that hockey thing was gonna work if they kept going the way they were gonna go. But you know what, sometimes you just gotta go try and do things, right? Sometimes you just gotta go try and do things. Mm -hmm. You never know what happens unless you don't try it. That you gotta try. You gotta try. Yeah, everybody's gotta try something. We saw a TikTok video with you and your mom and a coat. Where did you find the coat? Dude, I bought. So that's a coat. It's a bit. Hold on, let me. I can we get it for you? This is the coat. Oh my god, that's awesome! It can embarrass a mom. I love this coat. <laughs> I love it because uh, I bought it at some vintage store in uh, in California, and I love it so much, mostly because it just makes people laugh. Um, and my mother, when I put it on, she just looked at me and she said, what are you wearing? <laughs> what are... So, and then I said, Ma, this is what I normally wear. And it makes her laugh. So if I can make my mother laugh, it makes me happy. And uh, this coat makes my mother laugh. So that's, so I just bought that, that coat at a, used, at a used clothes store in California. And it's so warm. It's so warm that I love it. I imagine. It's Plus, it's warm. hilarious with the ears. And it's kind of funny. Uh, so, someone earlier asked if you like root beer. I love root beer. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. And if yeah. you like, if you like root beer. Love root beer. And someone also asked if uh, me and Bob play video games. We do. We love playing video what, games. What do you play? Fortnite. Simple as. Now, do you um, do you have anybody in there going and finding stuff for you, or are you doing it on your own? Uh, I mostly do everything for him. Sometimes. Do you? Hmm? Because that's your job as a brother. That's your job. Your job is to take. You know that there's a very famous phrase: "Am I my brother's keeper?" And you are. You have to both do that for each other. I'm the younger one, though. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Any interview uh, advice for us? Any interview advice? No, you're doing great. Just keep at it. You know, the thing is this, is that you can't worry too much how an individual interview goes. You have to, especially when you're new, you just have to learn a little bit here, learn a little bit there. And it takes a long time to become very, very comfortable at it and give yourself the permission to grow. Give yourself the permission to listen. Uh, if you are a good interviewer, you're a good friend because you're a good listener and you're empathetic. You have to see the world through other people's points of view. So as you start interviewing more and more and more, I know it's early and it's, we're having fun, but think about that down the road the more you do this. You want to be able to see the world through other people's points of view and you want to be curious, but you don't want to be curious just for your knowledge. You want to be curious to build connections because that's what people at home need. So what, you, what the three of us are doing right now is fun for us, but we're keeping people company, right? Who are sitting at home and some people who are watching are having a great day and some aren't having a great day. And it's our job to keep them company and share ideas. And that's what a good interviewing is. So the more you remember why you're doing this and who's watching, the better it will be. Now, listen, have fun. It's gotta be fun too, right? But yeah. And, and all that stuff. You're 11 years old, so let's let's get let's rip. Let's have a good time. But at the same time, always as you grow and do this more, that's my advice: is just keep remembering who's watching and that you're there to keep them company. Yeah, and that there's 81 people, 82 people watching. 
That's a lot of people. Do you play video games? I play um, NHL. I play NBA. What play console? FIFA, uh, on a PS4. I have an Xbox. I had an Xbox, but I kept getting that ring of death. I've gone through three Xboxes. They keep breaking on me. So, and the other game I play is Grand Theft Auto, which you shouldn't be playing right now. Um, so, you know, don't, don't play that game. game. Um, but I, I love FIFA. I love FIFA. I, but I, so, PS, I'm a PlayStation guy. Like I said, I, I, have an X, I have an Xbox, but I just kept tossing it out because I kept getting that, that red ring of death on it. It kept breaking. He plays on Switch. I play on Xbox. Xbox? Play on Switch? Oh, cool. Um, I don't play on my phone or on my iPad. I don't play that. So I like, um, there's also a motorcycle racing game called MotoGP that I'll play that, you know, from time to time. Um, I, 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 I downloaded Fortnite, so I might actually start playing Fortnite. You know, at some point I've been locked in this house in isolation for so long. I got to figure something out. You, if you get it, DM, DM us if you get it and we can give you our usernames and help you. We can help you get the fir your first Victory Royale. We did that with our friend. And I guess he's pretty happy now. And we got one today, so that's pretty easy. Yeah. Nice. Well, most of the time when I used to play video games, now what I do is I play piano or try to learn guitar. But it is also fun. And I was thinking a lot about how it's like, I need to start playing with my, my video game system a little bit more, uh, for sure. But I love, I love, uh, I love playing soccer on uh, FIFA on, um, on, on, on my, my PlayStation. But, I, you know, I, I, there's a new PlayStation coming out too, right? I think a PS5. So I don't. I, I keep seeing rumors about that. Do you guys play any musical instruments? Uh, I I started playing the saxophone. It's really hard. I was I playing the playing it. It's really hard. I was playing the trumpet. Then I switched to euphonium. And mostly, for in, like I usually just bang on myself like. And it gets pretty annoying. He loves drums. It. It gets pretty annoying for the rest of the family. Well, that's true. But I'm sure they annoy you too at times, right? So <laughs> at least with music, it's good. Yeah. Um, at least it has a good outcome. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to, I might get a guitar. Because my friend actually knows how to, his dad knows how to play on electric guitar back in black. Like the first set of oh, yeah. You know, especially if you like punk music, you really only need to know two and a half chords. <laughs> music, but in punk music especially, um, and then it allows you to focus on what you're going to say, what your lyrics are. That also really matters. Yeah. So. Oh, and, and here's the thing, Bob and Tom. Here's the thing. In 10 years from now. Oh, I remember. I remember. Yeah, go ahead. Someone asked, said this. Do you ever get frustrated while playing video games? Yes, he does. I get way too frustrated. He gets Dude, very, was, very not frustrated and usually takes it off. <laughs> I, because sometimes in, I might hard. rage quit way too many times. <laughs> I was playing Guitar Hero Legends of Rock, and at one of the battles, you have to battle against Tom Morello, the guitarist from Rage Against the Machine. And Tom Morello beat me for an hour straight. An hour, I was so frustrated. I was by myself in my house playing Guitar Hero, going crazy. And he kept beating me, beating me, beating me. And I'm not gonna lie, at the one hour mark, I, and I was battling him again, his, his video game character, his avatar. And I was like, oh, I lost again, but I had actually beaten him. And the, the big screen just went, boom, you won. I maybe have never been more happy, more elated in my life than when I fought. And then after I got to beat Tom Morello, they, you get to do a duet of Bulls on Parade, one of my favorite Rage Against the Machine songs on Guitar Hero. But for an hour, I was so frustrated. I was so beat up by him. It was, it was, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sometimes it's kind of fun being uh, having your brother rage against you when you're shooting him in Fortnite in creative at, in a 1v1 skirmish yep. that he made. Yep. Uh. You are very so socially conscious. What advice do you have for kids who want to make the world a better place? That you can't make the world a better place, but what you can do is make your neighborhood a better place. 
And yeah. if, if everybody made their neighborhood a better place, then collectively, we would make the world a better place, right? The idea of changing the world is really difficult to do and it, and, it, and it intimidates people because how do you change a world, right? People are different. But what you can do is change your neighborhood. You have to, you know, you have to be strong for the people who can't be strong, who are not allowed to be strong. You have to be a voice for the voiceless. So don't think about the big picture all the time. It's good to know about the big picture, but where can you make a difference in your neighborhood? Who needs help? How can you, how can you be there? That's what I would say when you're a kid. As you get older, it will grow. You know, make sure you're reading the right things. When I was about 14 years old, I had a job making sub sandwiches at a restaurant called Mr. Submarine, like a fast food place. You know that, right? And I, I researched about it, and you were also a forklift driver. Was a forklift driver, that's right, at the airport, not about a few years later. But one day I was walked into my, um, my job wearing a Walkman, right, listening to a punk cassette, a tape. And the guy was a little bit older than me said, what are you listening to? I said, I was listening to, like, I think it was The Misfits. And he said, why do you like punk? And I said, you know, make, you question the answers, right? And he said, no, man, question the questions. Meaning you can't even trust the sources, right? So that to me became a really big inspiration in how I, I, I activated myself for social change, you know, and to be socially conscious. Because you listen to enough of the right lyrics, you start to realize that people are being oppressed. And if you are in a position, especially because look, we're white guys. White guys have a lot of privilege. You have a lot of privilege that I have a lot of privilege that people won't have just because of our upbringing, because of the color of our skin. So it's important to recognize that and to do your best. Now you're 11, so it's different, right? How you do it, but there's little ways to do it. Look at what Greta's doing. There's a lot of different ways to have positive impact in your neighborhood. And uh, I think you can do that at every age. Any age or every age. Exactly. You can even be in like a little baby and just everybody will be so inspired. Okay. What if you can't... Never mind. I don't want to... What if you can't what? What if you can't talk? Well, no, but that's... If you can't talk, that's different. And that's important, right? You don't want to be... Have you guys heard the word ableism? Do you know what that is? No, I don't. So ableism is this idea that people who are able-bodied, right? Um, who can speak, who can see, who can hear, who have access to their legs and movements like we tend to see the world through that filter, but there, it's important to recognize that not everybody has the same abilities that you do and that we can't just see the world from our position, right? And if you can't speak, there are different ways that you can be politically active and you can be a leader. And it's your job if you are able-bodied to help create a space. You know, when you walk into a restaurant that doesn't have a, a wheelchair accessible ramp, that's a problem. And you can fight for that. You can just ask the, 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 the restaurant owner, hey, how come this isn't accessible? You don't want to fight them because it's not, you, we all have different ways of doing it. But it's about just reminding people to see the world through other people's points of view and recognizing that your reality isn't the only one that's out there. Yeah. And that's a very important thing. What are some of your career goals as you move forward? You know, it's funny because I've done most of the stuff that I wanted to do, right? And it's like, oh, now what? But what I like to do is I like to tell stories and make movies, make movies and TV shows that are scripted. I like radio. I like going on and telling and sharing music. So I'll continue to do that. I never get tired of, I used to have a daily radio show. I miss that. Being on the air every day. I love doing that, playing radio. Why did you start doing this show? Actually, he started it. Me? Why did you start uh, It's Brent Fitz's problem that she started the show. Oh yeah, it was Brent Fitz from two. His problem. It was his problem. He he started it. We started the show because of him. Because we could not go out and film ask, like film stuff. stuff. We could not film YouTube episodes so we saw you know yeah. we saw him do it. Yeah. And, like talk to people, talk to people with split screen, and it kind of on Instagram Live it kind of took that over and made it more popular. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody asked why we wanted to inter interview Scr Strombo. 
Um, well, actually, Chris Van Lee said you were his idol, so we asked you. That's literally it. And plus, you're actually pretty interesting. Uh, you have a very interesting background, and we just wanted an interview. Like, how we're getting, how we got Ethan Page was, uh, so during this clip in the Chris Van Lee video, it looked like I was yawning, but I was actually like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and then we still do not know. But what then he said doing. this. Why don't you get someone more amusing on, like me? Something like that. And then we got him. And then we got him. Every single time that a joke comes out, every there's at least one person who we at least get we get at least one interview every time we get a joke. So yeah. like some kind of good. Sometimes people come on there like we would like to ask like you actually came on one of our interviews like came on and watched and we were like hey can we interview you head out we were kind of oh yeah and then paul dastney came on and we asked him biz nasty biz nasty <laughs> oh, oh paul bisonette yeah yeah he's a great oh, wait, guy no. out of all the jobs outside of the media what was your favorite you know what? I was an usher at a movie theater, and I loved that job so much because I got to eat popcorn all day. <laughs> really happy. I eat popcorn the way most people breathe air, and I love popcorn. And also, I got to watch free movies, so I would sneak into the movie theater when I was working to watch the films. I love movies so much. So the movie theater job was maybe my favorite. I was also a mascot. I wore a big green lizard. Yes, I remember that. You were a I was, lizard. I was a lizard. That, that job was kind of brutal because it was the summer and I was so hot in that costume. But, and I was only, I think I was only nine years older than you are now when I did that job. But I was 14 but, when I got the job at the movie theater and that job was my favorite job aside from this stuff that I do now. But that job might even be my favorite job regardless. Uh, what's your favorite movie? A movie called Die Hard and a movie called The Blues Brothers. I know what Die Hard is. I haven't watched it though. There's probably Blues like a million. Great, probably, it's a great beat. I watched Bro I watched Brooklyn Nine Nine, so there was like a thousand references. Dude, 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 how funny is Captain Holt? Very, very funny. Awesome. He's my when he when he goes up to Gina. Now nah, I'm curious about your life. I like the gab. That to me, I watched that a thousand times. Uh, Captain Holt is my favorite character on all of television. I just want to say this. I love watching Magic for Humans. There's this funny part where he does an illusion where he thinks this is your real hand, but it's not. Right, and, and he's he, thing. It's a fake one, and he smashes it with a hammer, and the guy's like, ow, but it's not his real hand. It's kind of weird and funny. I watched, <laughs> I watched that. The other, uh, I watched that just the other day, that episode. Yeah, it was just like uh, the hammer test. Just pulls up a hammer, smashes the hand with the hammer. It's just like, then he pulled the cloth I, out. <laughs> I, but my favorite thing about that show is when it's not the person he's playing the trick on, but it's their friend's reaction. When he put that uh, that hat on that woman's head and showed her the three point oh, yeah. one, right? And she remembered every number and her friend. Hi. That yeah. made me so much. Uh, Bart Andre Frey asks, uh, what's your favorite team from Nevada? Ah, uh, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, my favorite Rocky team from Nevada, from Nevada are the Las Vegas Golden Knights. <laughs> Which is also my favorite team. Listen, Mark, Mark, Andre, Mark Andre Fleury is amazing. And Max Pacioretty, as a former Montreal Canadiens fan, as a Montreal Canadiens fan, he was a former Montreal Canadian, so I'm happy that he went there. But uh, I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan through and through, so I don't like any other team at all. I respect the LA Kings, and I work with the LA Kings, so I'm allowing myself one team in the West to do that. But I loved the the that the run that the that the Golden Knights went on. I love that run. And then we got whooped by the by Washington. Let's not talk about that. Let's not talk. About that. But I'm happy for Ovechkin. Yeah, you got to be. And Holpe. And Holpe, that's right. Brayden Holpe, Brayden Holpe was in my house talking about Gord Downey when we did our special for the Tragically Hip. Uh, did you comb your hair for this? 
with my hands. With my hands. That's all I did. Yeah, I, you, I noticed you were going like this a lot, which I you know, never do. I don't even comb my hair. Not even listen, with my hand. Tom just like... Listen, bro, listen, bro you're going to need to at some point. Well, maybe... maybe, yeah, maybe I never, saw my hand... I hope you never need to comb your hair ever. But it's so I don't have air conditioning here, so it's so hot in my house and my I'm sweating and I'm just putting my hair to get it out of my face. My hair is now because this is my quarantine hair, it's so long. Well listen, listen, okay, so you're in an interesting place because I love metal and punk. So metal, long hair, punk, shaved head, short hair. So it's like finding how you wanna do it. Someone asked if I've been to a concert. I went to the interrupters. What? Yeah. Me and my dad did. It was really good. That's amazing. I, I went to the Interrupters Arkells. Tell tell the one you went to in Espanol with me. Oh wait, uh, his Steve Earle. Oh Steve Earle. I I don't really like concerts that much because I get to some sort of feeling in my brain. They're loud. I I saw no, the you were meeting Steve Earle, right? Yeah, you met Steve Earle. Steve Earle. Oh, Earl played a concert right here in my living room, and he was incredible. And I wonder how many concerts have been in your living room. Oh my goodness, I have so many. My hearing is not the same as it used to be. So yeah. many. Yeah. Actually, when I, I actually got an Interrupter shirt I was going to wear today, now it's like my favorite shirt besides this one. That's actually, awesome. the comment section when he wore it was spammed with uh, uh, awesome. Cool. That's great. <laughs> It was spammed with it. I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> Ask that question. Maraschino wants to buy us a soda, so only if it's from Italian Star Deli, which is that we've actually interviewed this Italian Star. Kind of cool. No, well, it didn't, didn't come out yet. Hmm? Oh, we will stop by when we come to, 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 to Toronto. Toronto. We will stop by. We would love to. That'd be great. Honestly, Honestly we would. We would. Thank you for joining us. Maybe if we ever come to Toronto, we sh will have to get together again. See ya. Thank you for taking your time with us. Bye. Keep, listen, the secret to life is to just keep doing things, and you're doing amazing work, and I'm really happy to be a part of this with you. Uh, keep doing it as long as you love it. And if down the road you have a guest that cancels on you last minute and you need to fill it, just send me a DM and I'll come back on. See ya. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>